when a car has a national nickname, it's probably part of like the culture, right? So Gushesh. Or the Vura, for instance, the VR6. There's some brands in this country which are really iconic. They don't necessarily make the best cars um, all the time, but it, they've connected and got under the skin of South Africans more than any other brands. And, and this is one of them. I grew up around Beamers. Um, I think that brand will always have a bit of a special place in my heart. My one uncle was a um, BMW racing mechanic. He did crazy things. Like he did like engine swaps before engine swaps were cool. Like he put big engines in like old five series and stuff. And you know, we'd, we would drive around in those. So for me, um, South African car culture is inextricably linked to BMW as a brand. There's, that's that's quite amazing. I'm not sure there's any other country in the world where we name our cars as a society. We can all agree that that's a gushesh. And that's a really cool thing, right? I love that for us. That's car culture for me. South Africa has probably one of the most amazing car histories of any country in the world. In terms of what we were able to build, what we were able to develop, the South African specials that came out of this country, like the Gushesh, for instance, that are icons today and that are worth a lot of money today. There was some racing back in the day where these cars used to battle it out on the track. And I never um, got to actually go see it in real life. I was a little bit too young. And we've got this really cool racing history uh, we also had Formula One in this country, and I'd love to see it come back, you know? Drop. My dad was a bit of a car guy. He had some cool cars. He had a Mustang, uh, original 68. I've got a picture of me as like a two or three year old, maybe sitting on the bonnet. I just remember that, that very distinctive V8 warble in my head that I don't know if you've ever heard an original Mustang but it's like boop, 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 and the whole you know everything kind of around it shakes we had a, a combi which I loved because it had that little passage between the front seat and the passenger seat that you could run through which I thought was just the coolest thing when I was like four my dad actually was a, a mechanic well not a practicing mechanic but he'd done his apprenticeship and everything so he knew a bit about what was under the bonnet as well the passion got reignited when I met a really nice girl in matric and her dad was a car collector and a racing driver. And I remember being in the house one night and seeing Jeremy Clarkson review a Ferrari Enzo. And it was the first time I'd ever seen Jeremy Clarkson do his job. And I looked at it and I was like, that's what I want to do for a living. And yeah, it's kind of worked out. My first car was an E30 Beamer. It looked a lot like this, it was white and it was a hand-me-down from my dad. When my sort of motoring career picked up and I had this like steady stream of test cars to drive, I was like, why do I need to buy a car? It seems like a waste of money, right? And then it came to about 2018 and I was like, I'm a car journalist without a car. That's a bit tough, right? Like I, I think I should own something with four wheels. So I started hunting around and this little Mazda came up at this really cool dealership in Cape Town. It's a little MX-5, it was red, but it was quite special because it had been supercharged by the previous owner. I'm walking around this car and I'm like, those wheels are familiar, even that radio familiar. I said to the salesman, I said, does this car belong to a guy called X? And he was like, yeah, how the hell did you know that? And I was like, well, I used to date his daughter. So, <laughs> so this car came back to me. So I, we got our licenses together when we were 18. And uh, because it was the cheapest car that he owned, he used to let us take it out and whatever, we'd go to the movies or whatever. So this particular little red Mazda was one of the first cars I ever drove after I got my license. And it came back to me. It ran beautifully from day one, it was really low mileage. It made financial sense to sell it recently and I sold it. And here's another top tip for petrol heads. Don't sell cars that you love. Like I should have just made a plan. I don't know, I should have sold a kidney. I should have started a second career somewhere, got into crypto. I miss that car so much. The guy who bought it has 20 cars and he has another one like mine. I'm like, dude, what do you need two Mazda MX-5 for? Just give me mine back.
My favorite car is actually the one I bought last year. It's an E39 BMW M5. It's a 2001. It was literally the car I had on a poster on my bedroom wall in the same color. It's just incredible how the world brought us together after all these years. Every time I take that thing out, which is actually not that often, I just have the biggest smile on my face. Cars make our lives comfortable and convenient, and that's why we're willing to pay so much for them. There's also a lot of status involved. I always say to people, if you park the car and you turn around and you look at it and you lock it and it doesn't put a smile on your face, you bought the wrong car. There are bargains out there and I kind of recommend this kind of motoring because it's potentially a great way to save money and drive something really cool. So I just bought a 1996 V8 Lexus LS 400 for 65,000 Rand, right? You must see this thing. It's like going to like a meeting in a 90s boardroom where they like have whiskey on the side in a decanter. It's got like wood paneling, beige leather everywhere, big comfortable seats, beige carpets, beige roof. The whole, it's massive. It's like a tank, it's like five meters long. It's got this thirsty V8 under the bonnet. I got it for 65 grand. The cheapest car in South Africa is 159,000 Rand. It's a Suzuki Espresso. And I got a V8 Lexus for like a third of that, right? And you know what? If it, if it like catastrophically breaks down, it's running really well actually. But if, if it like explodes and costs me another 65 grand, I'm still winning, right? I'm still under the cheapest car in the country. So I would say to people, there are alternative ways to, to look at the car buying experience. Take something like a Toyota Cressida, right? Legendary car, super easy to maintain. Parts are everywhere, L like super, super comfortable. Yeah, it's gonna cost you a bit more in petrol than like, you know, a small little run around, but you've got no monthly installments, you know? Insurance is cheap as hell. You go get yourself a Cressida for like 40 grand, put 20 grand into it. You got like one of the best cars on the road and you've saved yourself a ton of money. You know, you don't have to go to the bank and be like, hey, please give me a high interest loan so I can work my ass off, so I can pay this loan back every week, every month. You know what I'm saying? One of the things I use on the Cars of Coz app all the time is the new car specs page, right? Which a lot of people don't actually know. And I try to tell as many people of this as I can. So that pricing in that app dynamically changes all the time. So if you're looking for the latest price on a car, it's in the app, it's up to date. It's so easy to use. It's so well thought out. I mean, we, we also have the widest selection of cars. So, you know, why start your search anywhere else? Like we got everything, you know, new and used as well, which is, which is super, super cool. I have nothing to do with the development of that app. I just tell people about it. So kudos to our team who builds that app because they're doing a great job. Dream, search, drive. Cars.coza.